talk a little bit about floral design and go through this, this slide set and first thing I need to let you know that, that uh, I am not a florist. Um, I do know a little bit about floral design but just enough to be actually pretty dangerous. So I'm going to just review the principles of design and actually um, there, there's a two course series at Front Range Community College taught by Judy Boggs. It's actually quite good if you want to get some more effort, more course material, more background in floral design. Um, principles of design um, in, in floristry is not a whole lot different than the principles of design in landscape design. So everything pretty much holds true. Uh, when you're designing a, a floral arrangement, um, think about your focal point first. And the focal point is your area or accent or the center of your arrangement to, to draw attention to it. And don't forget balance. And balance works a couple of different ways. It works both as a mechanical balance where things are balanced like on a teeter-totter or something like that. But it's also a visual balance as well. You want things to, to look uniform. And you don't want it to look like it's going to fall over. <coughs> and you can use color to enhance your balance as well. Um, so balance is looked at e either as symmetrical or asymmetrical. And your emphasis, you want to look at where, where you want to draw attention to your, to your design. Another part of design is proportion. <coughs> proportion, you need to focus on the size and shape of your proportion and how your your floral arrangement is, is going to be uh, pictured. You can use proportion, you can modify proportion with textures, with shapes, with different colors. And you want to scale your flowers to your focal point where you, your smaller flowers might be on the outside bringing in to your central, your central display where you're going to use your larger flowers as, as a focal point. Poor, poor proportion is something like where the vase or the bowl is too big or the flowers are too, too large and too in mass. However, some good floral designers can use proportion in a way that you would normally look at it as being wrong, but to enhance the whole piece of work. Some of the things that are really critical in any floral arrangement or any design there is, whether it's an interior scape or a landscape or um, uh, design of, a, of, a, of an apartment or a room, or something like that, is you need to think about rhythm. And rhythm is more than what we normally think of as music. Uh, you can use rhythm, you can use what's called opposition, where you're creating repeating pattern opposite to one another. And they're going to compete against each other when you use opposition to bring your focal point into the middle. Another type of uh, rhythm is repetition, where you're using lots of different flowers uh, of a single color or s to emphasize a single unit, or they could be the same species. And you're going to repeat that use of color, or you might repeat that rhythm in texture, whether it's a fine texture or a coarser texture. Radiation. Uh, radiation as in radiating from a central point where you might use different uh, pieces of uh, uh, materials that could be um, in linear fashion where the centers intersect to bring your focal point as a line of convergence. Transition is another type of, rep of rhythm that we use where we look to transition in a more um, gradual manner and we can use color to transition, we can use shades to transition, we can use textures to transition. So we use transition to bring in that gradual change and to bring our focal point to our center of interest. Harmony. <coughs> and we'll talk a little bit about harmony here in a minute when we talk about colors. You want to use elements that don't clash. Um, Container, flowers, foliage, and composition, they should all complement the same uh, element. You want to use uh, shapes and size and textures to complement, not to clash. 
So some of the things that we use to get rhythm in place and to bring balance and harmony into our floral design, one of the first things we use is the concept of a line. And we can use, uh, in our floral designs, we can use lines in many different ways. This line here on this, this small uh, drawing where we can go from the top of the arrangement and it swoops down and the line moves slightly to the left. This has actually got a technical term. It's called a Hosgerth curve. And it's very common in uh, design arrangements where you can see that it's, it's balanced to the right and it's balanced to the left. But we, the line that you're seeing is this, this swooping inverted J to the left. And this is the framework that brings the composition together. So some of the emotional responses, if you're trying to, to, to bring together in a design, that you can use vertical lines emphasize strength, strength of uh, character, strength of in your arrangement, whereas horizontal brings out an emotion of more tranquility, relaxation. Curves, you can think of a gentle, gentle motion, and diagonal is anxious, gives you it's it's generates anxiety. And you can use these in any kind of design perspective that you're working on. Form. Form is our three-dimensional aspect. Um, and the three-dimensional uh, spheres that we have, three-dimensional structures, you can have a pyramid, a sphere, cone, cube, or cylinder. And we typically apply this in a two-dimensional strategy where this top arrangement to the left which actually looks like something I would do. Um, that's very you know, very st stark pyramid. It's upright. Whereas this arrangement to the top right, where we have the liatris coming out the top, it's still got that pyr 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 pyramid effect, but yet we're generating a vertical line to give it more strength, more character. Um, that might be used uh, uh, in different kinds of environments to to generate. Uh, bring a focal point to that part of the room. Um, I would see a piece like this in a law office where they're wanting to, co to configure that we're a strong organization. Now, this lower piece where we have the carnations that are kind of splayed out and it's very um, horizontal, we have, we have carnations and we have um, um, some Hawaiian flowers that just uh, left my brain. Anthrinum, excuse me, thank you. Um, and that's to generate a, a tranquil most. So you would see this probably in a spa or something like that. Or maybe a casket piece where you're looking at something to be more tranquil. How you use space is kind of, uh, you can use it either as a negative or a positive in this, um, very tightly designed uh, pyramid form where there is no space. We've, it's a solid form where the antirhinums and theriums over here, the white antheriums, very loose, very open. So um, positive space, of course, is occupied by plant material in the container. Negative are the voids. And you can use space to define your, bound, your boundaries in such a way. So, other things that we can do in our elements of design, texture. Texture refers to the characteristics of the flower, the foliage, the plant materials. You are taking, when you take plant materials, you talk about the texture of the foliage, you talk about whether it is a um, simple or entire leaf, whether it's a, um, where it has dent, uh, dentate or, or lobed or these sorts of things, all of these things offer texture and character to our arrangements. Um, it refers to the surface, um, the, whether it's, it's hard or shiny. For instance, the, an the anthuriums are real shiny and real, s real uh, solid. Um, you want to, to have a balance of your textures, like these arrangements, this arrangement on the top, we have uh, lots of of uh, feathery textures and 
this arrangement with the liatris on the, on the bottom, we have probably stronger lines, but we used these to retain our attention. Color. Color is probably one of the most important parts of floral design, and it's one of the parts that, that really people mess up the most on. And, um, and this is in both in, in any kind of design aspect, whether your interior design, choosing the paints in your, um, in your living room, or anything like that. Color is, is really important that we need to look at, and it also has a major impact on our moods and feeling. Um, and you should arrange your colors in an orderly fashion. Um, and we need to think of the basic colors, the primary colors, secondary, and tertiary. And think about your color wheel and um, how we use color. Now, hue refers to color. You all think about the hue settings on, on your TV and these sorts of things, or the monitor. Uh, the basic hues are red, orange, yellow, green, violet, and blue. And if you'll notice, these are set up in the color wheel like this with red is over to the, the left hand uh, corner. And the, you can also think of these as temperatures, whereas red is hot, where your blues are cool. So our primaries, red, yellow, and blue, red, yellow, and blue in, the, in, this, in this. And the secondary colors are mixtures of the primaries in equal proportions. So red and yellow makes orange. Red and blue makes violet. Yellow and blue makes green. And that's how the colors are mixed together. Tertiary colors are a mixture of the primaries with the adjacent secondaries, so the ones that are next to each other, we mix those, red, orange, yellow, orange, so forth, so forth. That's how we get the next set of colors, and that's what we call tertiary colors. If you've played any with Photoshop, <coughs> these uh, knowledge of how these color wheels work together is, is pretty important. And the value has nothing to do with the color, but it has to do how much black and white is blended into that. And that's how we get our off tones. And the val when we add the value, that's what uh, gives us our tint. And the tint is a hue where we've added white to it. A shade has been darkened with black. And the tone, um, is where we've actually reduced the brilliance, okay? And intensity is another modification of the hue. Now, if you play with Photoshop, you can see these different things. Well, the flower designers are looking at these, at these functions all the time, and they're especially looking at fabrics, they're looking at wall colors, and how they set up these sorts of things. What organization do you think has done more research on color and how it impacts human emotion. What organization would you think has done more research on that? Which industry? Food industry? No. Kids. Which industry? Kids. Children? No. Fashion. What's that? Fashion? Fashion? No. The Navy. The Navy. <laughs> The wow. Navy. Why is that? Uh, I wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't paying attention. I, I'm honest, but I was kind of Why do you think the Navy has anything to do with color? color? The Navy has done tons of research on colors. Exactly. Colors of the walls in a submarine and how it impacts the mood and the ability of their military sailors to focus on the task at hand. And actually, the Navy has done more than anybody else. What color do they use? Inside subs? Yes. I don't know. They asked me to do sub duty. Yeah, they, have, they have special, this, I don't, they have ex different colors for different levels. Okay. Submarines are different. 
So how do we use color in a design? Well, there's a monochromatic where we all have this, we're using all the same tints and shades, and we can use that monochroma monochromatic to provide harmonious and a harmony blending of our, of our flowers using that it's from a single hue. We have analogous harmony, which we're using two or three hues found next to each other on the color wheel. We need to start focusing on the color wheel. Okay? So anal anal analogous harmony is set up that way. And then we have complementary, where the complementary is where we're focusing on opposites. Like opposite from red is green. Christmas. Okay? That would be a good example of how that's used as a complementary one. Split complementary is where we're using a color and two colors from a di directly adjacent. In other words, orange going with blue, violet, and a light green. If you were to go to Home Depot or Lowe's or someplace like this, go and look at the paint chips. You'll see now that almost always at the, at the paint aisle, they're selling paint chips in groups of three. And you can choose, uh, these, are com these are colors that you can either go with complementary, split complementary, or harmonious different patterns to establish different moods in different kinds of rooms and such as that. Um, the Bear website is absolutely fantastic. Uh, B-E-H-R paint and you can go in and you can actually take a photograph of a room and paint your room on the computer screen to choose your colors to generate the mood that you're looking for. Triad is where colors lie equal distance and from each other on a color wheel and where you can use red, yellows and blues, red, orange and so forth. And a tetrad uses four hues. At this point, we're starting to get confusing. Color temperature is also very important. We talked about color temperatures early in the semester in relationship to lights, but color temperature is now in, in, in relationship to mood. Um, colors that have the quality of being warm or cool. So red and yellow give that warm feeling, and uh, those warm colors give high visibility and they appear to advance towards you. It feels like they're coming at you. Whereas cooler colors recede from the viewer. And in fact, uh, in, a, in interior design, cooler colors are often used on a wall that's visible from a hallway to give the room a um, receding or actually makes it feel like it's larger. If you want the room to feel smaller and more intimidating, use a, a warm color. So these are some of the ways that we use color. So a cool color, a cool arrangement offers a different mood than a warm arrangement. And it's divided into um, half warm and half cool. So green and red, it, you can actually change what we normally consider to be cool colors uh, or warm colors by just adding different shades and tints. So in floral design, yellows, oranges, and reds, they're cheery, they're bright, uh, they lift the mood. Blue and greens, and stuff, those are refreshing, kind of cool, relaxing. Violets and purple impact, uh, bring out spirituality. Um, more, whereas the dark shades oftentimes are used, some people look at them as actually being depressing. So we can use color to affect our balance. Darker colors uh, appear uh, heavier than lighter. So you can, if you can use dark colors to, to change the balance uh, in a relationship, whereas lighter colors uh, or brighter colors have a tendency to lighten up an arrangement. So let's talk a little bit about structure. Uh, some of the tools that you'd use for floral arranging. Um, uh, adhesives, um, 
frogs, almost everybody uses Oasis uh, Bowl. Uh, when you're looking at containers, uh, you typically, uh, for a container, for a, for a bowl, you want to make sure the height is less than the opening is wide. If you look at arrangements, that's they need to hold water. If it's metal, it needs to be treated to hold water or lined. And the style should be in harmonious design to the environment that it's going into, not just the arrangement itself. Vases, are cons that's a, a container whose height is greater than the opening. And then we also use what's called a water tube or pick, and these are little miniature water supplies. Floral foams, <coughs> if you've ever worked with floral foams, there's two different kinds of floral foams. There's wet and there's dry. The dry foam is for silks and dried, obviously, and does not saturate and holds together really strong. Flo wet, wet foams are designed to wick water and hold water to increase the life of your plant material. Um, if you're going to use glues and hot glues and such as that, there are two different kinds of hot glues. There's construction hot glue and there's floral hot glue. Floral hot glue is actually a much lower temperature. They still burn, um, but they're not nearly as, as, as um, hot. Knives, um, floral knives uh, are very important. A floral knife, a good florist uh, doesn't loan out their knife. It's very sharp. Um, they use what's called a sheep's head blade. Um, sheep's head blade, you've all probably used it already. It's, it's the same uh, blade that's used in grafting and budding. Um, uh, it uh, clean cuts, maximize the shelf life. And um, pruning, pruning uh, shears, I prefer bypass pruners, the ones that look like a scissor and not the anvil type that come down because in a floral arrangement, we want to make sure that we use a bypass pruner so we have a clean cut and not a mashed cut. Uh, of course, never use your pruning shears to cut floral wire. You can get floral wires in different gauges all the way up from fine, fine piano wire up to uh, very heavy. Florist ribbons. Um, if you go to a floral design show um, where they're uh, wholesale, you know, there's just massive amounts of ribbons that you can buy. Um, some have wired edges, some may be double-faced. These are just some of the numbers to go along with the floral ribbons that, that you have access to. Floral tape is a stretchy tape. It's almost, it's, think of it as like, um, you know, kind of feels like, acts like saran wrap in such a way. Florist wire, uh, the florist wire that you're going to buy is usually got enamel on it so it doesn't rust in your arrangement. And it's not springy, but it's soft enough that you can bend it. Um, 16 gauge wire, that's actually pretty heavy and it's hard to work with. Uh, most people use, now the gauges, as, as the numbers get larger, the wire gets smaller or very thinner, very thin. 32s and 36, that's for corsages and uh, for boutonnieres very, where you're working with pretty difficult or very dainty work, whereas most people are using 24s and 26s 22s for carnations and stuff. Most florists want to have their stems as straight as possible when they come in. When they start, if they want to start tweaking the stem, they're going to wrap and wire that stem so they can bend it to the shape that they want. So one of the wiring techniques, for instance, this is something everybody should learn how to do, is how to wire um, a rosebud. And the easiest way to do it is, is to take and slip it through the calyx and bend it down, spin it, and then wrap it. Um, and this is something we should all learn how to do. This is called a hook technique that's used on daisies and carnations where we actually run the wire through the stem. And these are some tactics that florists, and if you go into a major florist shop, they're, they're doing this faster than you can see. Thought I'd do a little, uh, get my trusty assistant, my, my wife, to show you how to do a bud vase. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, for a rose stem, the first thing that we do is we want to remove the prickles. And we, she's got a stripper here that's taking the prickles off. 
Um, and note that I'm not using the word thorn. And the next thing she's doing here is she's doing her cut underwater. And we want to promote the cut underwater in a small shop that's, that's going to work really well or even at home. We talked about cutting underwater last uh, two weeks ago already. Uh, you don't want to do that uh, time and time again where you start getting a bacterial soup into your, into your, into your system. And here she's arranging uh, this in a bud vase. And the compo which is the, the single rows, that is the uh, focal point of the arrangement. And then she's using leather leaf greenery and um, baby's breath gypsophilia to bring in other textures to pr promote our focal point on that rose stem. And the finishing point to this arrangement is a little piece of ribbon. So nice, well done. Uh, bud vase, um, inexpensive, but yet kind of a classy look. We can do the same thing with carnations, where we've got our swooping line with the pink carnations in the same bud vase. And now here she's balancing the arrangement with uh, different textures with the leather leaf fern. See, so kind of. Um, taking that and bringing it into balance. And of course the finished product with the baby's breath and the ribbon to bring the component together. Uh, you can see that that's an, an asymmetrical design. You can see the line, you can see the curve, you can see how the textures play against each other to make that uh, a, a valuable piece. This is why my wife does this and not me. <laughs> Little bit on flower lore. Um, flowers have been used in our culture for um, many millennia. And I've often been asked, what are the meanings of some of the different flowers? Um, there, are, you can look this up in lots of different things. I'm actually getting this information from a website called aboutflowers.com, which is sponsored by the American Society, Society of American Florists. So um, we give flowers, we use flowers for lots of different reasons. We, we give them as gifts for thoughtfulness, for love, ex feelings that we don't feel that we can um, convey them in words. And a lot of people have their own meanings to what they give to flowers. So people ask me, what do the number of roses mean? That single bloom, um, is reflected as, as love at first sight or I still love you. And a single rose of any color is simple. It expresses gratitude. Two roses, however, means mutual feelings that we share. Three, again, is love. Seven, the specific meaning is infatuation. Ten roses? <laughs> Twelve? A dozen? We're not getting educated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Twenty four. Oh Twenty-five is actually a congratulatory. That's you should twenty-five roses is something that when you send a bouquet of roses to a uh, to a client or something like that for their sh for their restaurant or their store or their law office or something, that is a congratulatory statement, okay? Did he give you 108 roses? He missed the boat. <laughs> okay. That was a little offside. Anyway, <laughs> colors of emotion. We talked about how colors can drive emotion. And we use color in all different factions of our life. Um, the red Mustang, the red dress, and the, the walls and the co how they complement the fabrics and the materials. Color gives us balance, and 
we can use it as an attitude adjustment. There's been a lot of research on, on how uh, flowers create happiness in um, surprise, enjoyment, uh, in the presence of flowers, and the true power works in the brain. So everybody feels good if they get flowers, right? I had a bunch of high school kids in the greenhouses a couple weeks ago, and I asked the boys um, if their girlfriends, if they had one, wanted flowers. And they said, no, they don't want any flowers. And I asked the girls to correct the boys, and they absolutely did. <laughs> When's the last time you got flowers? Anybody? <laughs> If you got flowers, was it for romance or for congratulations? Or was it just because, you know? Do you have to have a reason? So, different kinds of moods that flowers can enhance. There's five different moods. Tranquility, romance, sensuous, nurturing, and you guys can all kind of feel these different things. Or whimsy. So I'm going to show you how we can use some of these things to get these different moods. And we can use that in our gift giving habits or maybe to bring in a little change in our own lives. So tranquility. Um, this is serenity. Um, peaceful palette. Sky. Sea. Light greens. Misty blues cool colors and if you're going to give something that you wanted to emphasize a tranquil thing this would be to a friend of yours that's maybe having way too much going on in their life they're way overwhelmed and this is going to bring a calming effect to their life now the florists that work in the hospitals know this very well so the f some of the kinds of flowers that you might want to use uh, you might, for your uh, greenery, you might use eucalyptus, uh, dusty miller. Uh, you'll use uh, flowers like hydrangeas and delphiniums, the light blues. Uh, Lysianthus is a common one. Uh, some of the tulips, uh, lots of carnations have these colors. Um, pussy willows. E you might want to use a clear vase or a clear bowl where the water can be seen with some gravel in there or something to give that tranquil that feeling of tranquility. Think of the stream side rippling in the background. Now romance is intimate and nostalgic, okay? Not necessarily what the guys are thinking, okay? Warm, cool colors, um, loving sentiments. Um, think of your mother or your grandmother um, brides to be something like this so you can see that we're using um, soft colors uh, they're a little bit of a blending of the warm and the cool um, to bring out that feeling of intimacy again uh, lysianthus and lilacs uh, come out uh, lots of uh, lilies roses uh, Gerber daisies eucalyptus and uh, heather um, Ulster Mary, these are some of the flowers that we use. Um, they use the word opulent and um, a thousand fl flowers, a uh, mille de fleurs. My French is awful. Sensuous. This is a luxury, a luxurious, rich mood that you're looking, you're looking for sophistication passion. We're using strong reds, purples, hot pinks, spicy colors. And this particular arrangement, this would be like for an elegant dinner, for um, uh, a party where you're looking to be extravagant. Okay, where you're trying to um, make, pull some mag magnetic feelings into this type of arrangement. So the pave look is um, where they're using um, carnations, they're using strong colors. Um, uh, nurturing. This is uh, where you would be taking this as a gift for somebody that's not feeling well, not having a good day, 
Uh, you want warm, soft, subtle colors, the creamy whites. And what this is, the goal is to make people feel warm and cared for, okay? So that's the nurturing look, where we're looking at the yellows, the pinks, um, make people feel safe and cared for. Uh, flowers, they've chosen this, are again, some of the carnations, hydrangeas, tulips, and they're looking at a garden style arrangement and it's more casual, it's a very casual look. Whereas ro uh, romance and sensuous is very formal. Whimsy, whimsical, uh, parties, celebrations, happy birthday, um, graduations. This is where you're looking at bold contrasting colors where things are opposite and you're pulling those together in your balance um, give you an upbeat tone, just more of a celebratory mood. And again, they're looking at, this is a garden style, uh, duplicating uh, trying to duplicate nature where they're using flowers that look like you just picked them out of the garden, out of your, so uh, of that. Now, wedding flowers. This, everybody thinks of flowers the first thing they think of is wedding. Have you picked your flowers out yet? No, I'm not getting married for a while. Okay. So um, some of the trends in flowers and weddings, this, is, this goes way back in our culture. The carrying flowers by the uh, bride roots in um, ancient times, strong smelling herbs, spices, to drive away the evil spirits, uh, to prevent bad luck in the wedding. and. Garlic and chives were often used in some of the early arrangements to, gar to ward off the evil spirits. Now, during the Roman uh, times, it was extended uh, where the, the bride and the groom would wear floral gardens, floral, floral, floral garlands to signify new life and fertility. Now, the bouquet that the bride carries is to symbolize that woman in bloom. Focus on the bride. I love the commercial from um, Men's Warehouse where he's focusing, telling the bride, says, well, everybody else is looking at, telling the groom, excuse me, everybody else is looking at the bride, she is looking at you. But anyway, um, it's, during the Victorian times, the flowers took on a strong significance where uh, send each other the Lovers would send each other messages using different flowers, each having its own meaning. And there are websites with tons and tons of meanings of different flowers, and most people have forgotten most of that. The groom is supposed to wear a flower that ap appears in the bouquet of the bride. That's important to remember. It goes in a buttonhole, or it's a medieval tradition of the, the knight wearing his lady's colors, the lady and that is the declaration of love. So the flowers need to match. What few weddings I've done, that seems to be a contrasting opinion. So, follow the fashion trends. That's always a challenge. Um, currently, uh, the fashion trend is individuality, not following the trend. Uh, one of the craziest things request I ever had was um, somebody looking for uh, orange tulips in July for a wedding and a lodge up halfway up the mountain in Keystone. I'm going, no, there are no, no orange tulips in July. Well, can't we custom grow those? And I said, it's May. <laughs> but anyway. Um, bridesmaids' bouquets are no longer expected to match the brides, that's the old tradition. Um, and color, blue, color in contrast to white is now uh, the common and not, the, um, it's, it's not what's expected. And we're moving more and more into the hand-tied bouquet as a style. Um, bold and powerful arrangements now are often uh, more value than the traditional romantic tones. Uh, we're seeing a lot more uh, monochromatic designs in the current trends, um, bringing to, into some uh, Zen philosophies and stuff in the designs. 
Um, and like I said, the hand-tied French bouquets is becoming more and more popular, especially for the bridesmaids. Um, other things that uh, people use flowers for is uh, welcoming gifts uh, for the parties, um, thank you gifts, uh, and also, of course, the rehearsal dinner and the wedding displays. Um, my wife and I did a wedding this, this uh, last summer where we probably spent more money and more time on the floral arrangements for the uh, rehearsal dinner than we did for the wedding itself. So, because they're all set up for the guests to take them home. So, uh, when you're working in floral design for weddings, you're rarely going to be doing them on site. So they need to be r robust enough and rugged enough to be transported. Um, so if you're uh, doing garden parties, uh, floating arrangements are very popular. Um, we're starting to see a lot of accessories for, for the bride's hair rather than the traditional veil. Um, um, those can get quite crazy. Um, another common practice is to make sure that, that the ceremony cer uh, entrance uh, should be with urns that can be later moved by the decorator to the reception. However, some churches now, Rick, once the flowers are in place, or the expectation is to leave those flower arrangements in the church as a gift to the church. Um, but that's different churches have different traditions. Uh, it's, it's always wise that if you're working with a florist to make sure that florist understands the rules of that particular church. And you can use candlelight and uh, flowers to give different um, dimensions to the design to accentuate different parts of the arrangement. Some of the things that uh, are traditions in some churches, um, to use a single rose to, to mark the seats of the grooms and the bride's mothers. Um, uh, some people will uh, use flower petals for a decoration piece. And uh, at the reception, using garlands um, at the head table. One of the mistakes people make oftentimes when they're decorating for events and banquets is making the flower arrangements too tall so people can't see over them and uh, focus on that. Uh, working with the caterer is important. Um, the bridesmaid's bouquet is often used uh, to decorate the cake table. Um, for a surround or the buffet table or on the uh, head table as well. And then of course the guest centerpieces and a lot of people will choose some kind of arrangement that the, um, uh, center, that the guests can take home. However, depending on what you're doing, um, like if you're using a lot of expensive vases and stuff like that, oftentimes that needs to be communicated so that the, the florist may be only renting the vases. Floating um, votives, um, rose petals on the cake and walkways. Um, one of the things that uh, if you have a decorator that's working with cakes, make sure that they um, working with the florist to know what flowers are edible and what flowers are poisonous. Um, most of what we use is pretty safe, but uh, we do run into problems like that occasionally. Um, there happens to be an extension publication on edible flowers at CSU, um, if you can find it. Um, and of course, the throwaway bouquet might go as a cake topper. Um, you can decorate all, you can go way over overboard with, with places to use flowers. Um, a lot of people starting to use rose petals instead of rice. Uh, for the bride and groom as they leave because um, a lot of places are, are saying you can no longer use rice um, to throw because rice is a rolling, um, it's very, people fall on it and um, or causes problems. Some people use bird seed but other places are getting away from bird seed and these sorts of things. Um, rose petals are very safe. So you're going to see uh, bouquets from the all-white formal um, 
These are some of the uh, common displays that uh, a lot of the floral designers are using. And one of the things I like about this one in the lower right-hand corner is look how the, the, the flow of the arrangement is being used to accentuate um, the bride's figure. And one of the things that's always good is the florist or whoever you're working with sh should already know what the dress looks like. Some popular arrangements, this is called a nosegay. It's a round cluster of flowers. And a nosegay is um, pretty common, it's pretty safe. Uh, this, the nosegay design goes back uh, centuries. And the nosegay was often carried uh, to mask unpleasant odors because back in the 14th century, bathing was not a common practice. Cascades, um, they, they're um, to accentuate the voluptuousness of the wedding. Uh, the cascade effect is used in very formal, very traditional uh, type arrangements. Whereas the hand tied is um, uh, more natural, um, it's, a, it's a French style, uh, more casual. These are typically what you see in garden weddings. Contemporary, um, unconventional. Um, typically, when you're going to use a contemporary design, you're going to use unconventional colors, unconventional flowers. Uh, here we've got a very wonderful blending of roses and calla lilies um, with, uh, to give a little bit of a cosmopolitan feel to the wedding. Some of the things that people think about when uh, they work with a florist is um, who meets with the florist? Who meets with the, uh, who the con wh who's getting what flowers? Um, where they're to be delivered? What's the cost payment? Most florists require a deposit and a due date because uh, oftentimes um, you're, the florist is making a significant investment in flowers and you can't just cancel the night before. Of course, if the guy walked out on you, uh, we're not going there. So the bouquet toss, this is kind of a, we've all been around that. Uh, we've seen the bouquet toss. Uh, anything worn by the bride in the 14th century when weddings really, really got pretty crazy is the bride would wear ribbons and she could tear them off and throw them into the crowd um, to distract the crowd because every any pieces off the wedding dress is considered to be good luck. And that way she could escape. So um, it developed from that into the garter toss. The garter toss actually came out before the bouquet toss. And the bride would toss the garter in the ground so that she could get away. Okay? But it was customary for the bride to toss the garter because the groom was typically drunk. And so just to avoid that, she could take it off and get it, do the, throw it out beforehand, which came up, which then developed into the toss, the bridal bouquet. And tossing the bouquet was um, a, considered to be the sign of happiness. And the craziest thing that I've ever seen is uh, Oasis company that manufactures the, um, the Oasis foam and the devices for bowls and such as that, they have divided what's called an exploding nosegay. And what it is, it's a piece where individual flowers are inserted into a device that when the, uh, you'll have 20, 30 nosegays because the tradition is when you throw the bouquet, what happens? Whomever catches the bouquet is the next to be married. Well. What an exploding nosegay does is when the bride turns her back, readies herself to throw the bouquet, she clicks a button, and when she throws it in the air, about halfway through the arch, it explodes into not one bouquet, but several dozen. <laughs> Everybody gets a prize. It's a whole lot of fun. 
There's no more, no more cat fighting for the bouquet. It kind of sucks all the fun out. <laughs> <laughs> the little, the little brides, the little girls that are the flower girls stuff, they love it. <laughs> They're very expensive. <laughs> okay, and I need to end this with a little bit on, on sympathy. Um, flowers are also used in our culture to uh, recognize the loss of a loved one. And it's, it's a safe way because a lot of people don't know how to sh share sympathy. It's a challenge. Um, and we can see changing trends in how we use flowers to commemorate death. Services now are getting simpler and simpler and simpler and, and, it, and um, uh, viewings are limited to one day. We don't have the long viewings. And of course, we're having more and more crem cremations and fewer and fewer or maybe even no memorial services. Um, it's surprising to know where people distribute ashes. Um, we won't go into that. So flowers have been traditionally sent to the funeral home. And if you look over, Paulwood Florist is right next to a major funeral home. And they're, they're co-located for a reason. I mean, you go to even the smallest community out in the prairie, the florist is usually right next to the funeral home. Now, just because there's no service doesn't mean you can't send flowers. And grief therapists all agree that rituals surrounding death are an aid in the grieving process. Uh, the funeral is not for the dead person. It's for the people that remain. So there's different kinds of uh, sympathy flowers. We have the wreath, the spray, floral arrangement, casket spray, and the inside piece. So the wreaths, they're, they're circles, the easel, is the spray, they're, they're mounted on the easel to, to adorn the church or the area of the casket. Arrangements, of course, in the casket spray and the inside piece goes with the deceased person inside the casket. So the wreath is used to symbolize eternal life, the constant circle. How many have been to a Jewish wedding? They use a round piece of bread to symbolize the eternal circle. Um, sprays are for viewing. They're typically used for viewing and they're placed on an easel because they're usually mounted behind the casket or something to um, only a one side viewing. Floral arrangements are typically uh, also considered something that somebody's going to take home. The sprays also are oftentimes taken to the gravesite. Casket sprays are to, are a typically purchased and paid for by the family. Um, and um, it's specifically put in place as a memorial from the family. Probably most of you don't realize that caskets, they're starting to make them wider and wider and wider for our culture. The inside piece, of course, goes inside the casket. Um, small nosegays, small sprays, usually by family members, and typically there's representation from the very youngest of the family members, children. Um, a lot of people give flowering plants or green plants. They feel that, uh, some people feel that it's more important as a long-lasting memorial. A lot of family members are afraid to get plants like this, however, because then they feel that if it dies, they're being irreverent. There's a phrase that uh, most florists cringe when they hear, and that's the phrase, in lieu of flowers. All you have to do is open up the obituary section and you'll see the word, in lieu of flowers. Why do people write that? Why do you think people write that? In lieu of flowers. Florists actually feel that this is pretty much demeaning to their industry. People think that flowers are a waste of money. I would think that most of you are in this room because you're taking floriculture don't think flowers is a waste of money. Flowers are part, important part of our culture and bereavement a long time. It, it originates from funeral directors who write the obituaries, not from the newspaper people, 
And the floral industry is, if you don't want to get flowers at your wedding, that's fine. But don't say in lieu of flowers, say memorial contributions may be sent to. One of my closest friends is a funeral director, and we, we talk about this a lot. And he tries to use this, but a lot of people write their own obituaries. If you're involved in a funeral, you're all going to be at this point, sooner or later. Before you make any arrangements, make sure the deceased has left any instructions. Now, if you're working with this, the person who signs it is bound to pay the charges. Um, and you need to see if there's any death benefits or estate to cover funeral costs. It's a challenging thing to do. You all will be faced with it. And if you choose to go into the floral industry, you'll be around it a lot. Funeral costs, it's actually regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. Funeral directors must ac offer accurate price information. Um, funeral directors must give you a written and itemized price list. And after making your selection, the funeral director must provide you with a written statement showing the costs, breakdown for each good or service purchased, and you cannot be required to purchase goods and services that you do not want. So um, it's a highly regulated industry because most people, when they're working with a funeral director, are um, somewhat handicapped by their emotions. <laughs>